In the unprecedented dispute over reducing the size of the city council in Ontario's capital city, the premier and his various opponents all claim that they are standing up for democracy and the democratic rights of Ontarians. Premier Doug Ford claims to be doing this, quote, for the people. An array of opponents claims to be standing up for the rule of law. Is this really a fight about opposing versions of democracy? Let's ask Marie Butrioni. She is former minister responsible for democratic renewal, now dean of the Chang School of Continuing Ed Education at Ryerson University. Karen Stintz, former Toronto City Councillor, past chair of the TTC, <coughs> candidate for mayor of Toronto in 2014. Deb Hutton, former senior advisor to Premiers Mike Harris and Ernie Eves, now a columnist at QP Briefing. Tricia Wood, professor of geography at York University and transportation columnist at Spacing Magazine. Mark Tuohy, radio host on News Talk 1010, one-time chief of staff to the current Premier's brother, former Toronto Mayor Rob Ford, and Andrew Coyne, columnist at the National Post, an all-around good guy, and we are delighted to welcome everybody uh, to TVO tonight for uh, a good, long, meaty conversation about, frankly, quite an extraordinary time in the history of our province. How extraordinary? Mr. Director, you want to roll these pictures from the wee small hours of the morning? Yes, here they were in the middle of the night at Queen's Park, protesting the fact that the galleries were cleared, people were inside, then they were outside, some on the outside wanted to get in, there they are trying to bang down the fences and get inside. It has been a most unusual, a most extraordinary, I'll use the word again, last couple of weeks in politics. And I just want to start, frankly, with some general reaction to where we are right now. You usually get the first word when you do the end. So why don't we keep that tradition I'm just alive get here? The last word, but yes, go on. Yeah. <laughs> what do you make of where we're at right now? Uh, it's crazy. It's completely unnecessary. Uh, it's an invented crisis. Uh, it's based upon a whole series of statements that are taken as dogma by the faithful, uh, lining up behind four, but have no actual factual basis to them. That. Toronto City Council is dysfunctional or any more so than any other elected body, that it's the job of the province to fix it if it were rather than the, the voters at the next election, that this is going to fix it, uh, or that it ha if it was a fix it, it has to be done right now, this week, this minute. It's all of it bogus and on top of all of that, when he couldn't get his way, he starts invoking the notwithstanding clause to push through legislation that had otherwise been found unconstitutional. It's, it's, a, it's a mess. More on that clause as we go on. Deb Hutton, where are you on this? Well, I'm going to disagree with Andrew. Just a little, <laughs> I suspect. <laughs> so we have a government elected just a few months ago to bring in some fiscal sanity to the province, which I think includes the municipalities as creatures of the province. They moved forward with legislation that was legitimately challenged, and they are responding legitimately and saying, in this case, we believe the legislature has the right to make a decision about how big Toronto City Council will be. So the institutions are responding and performing as planned. It's a temporary measure, as we all know, in the Charter of Rights that governments have the ability to use. Karen Stintz, where are you? Well, at this point, I think, uh, you know, I'm more pragmatic. It's, it's all happened. And if we're going to actually have an election on October 22nd, then... The government needed to use the notwithstanding clause because there is no way that an election could have taken place unless there was some certainty about the number of wards. And so, you know, I think Deb is right. The, 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 I, 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 I'll take a step back. I don't actually think it needed to be done right now. Certainly the government didn't campaign on it. I don't think we're going to see a nickel that's saved by it. But the reality is he was well within his rights to do it. A little bit of consultation may have been nice, but it wasn't there. And, uh, you know, the court made a decision and, and the government reacted. And if we're going to actually say, if we are going to have an election, a municipal election, this is the only way it's going to happen. Patricia Wood. I think I'm a little closer to Andrew. I think it's reckless from top to bottom. Uh, it demonstrates a, a lack of commitment to respecting deliberative democracy in terms of city council uh, and then on towards uh, the democratic conventions of the use of the notwithstanding clause. Um, and it's also for absolutely no good reason. And the, the government couldn't even bring a reason when they were challenged to court. So to do something so reckless that opens up so many uh, crises uh, for no reason except that I guess the province is still afraid of the city of Toronto uh, is, is not, not a good path for a democracy. Mark Tuohy. Uh, well, for something to be reckless, there has to be some great peril. And, and there is no peril here. I mean, this is something that the government has decided to do. I will, I will grant you that they never campaigned on this, and it was a surprise, and I think some people are not that happy with it, even supporters of the Fords. 
but I think it's something that needed to be done. And quite frankly, as much as it wasn't done in a very efficient or effective way, it's probably the only way you could do it. You can't do it after the election. Why because, not? Because then the council, even, even the lefties on council, have, have told me that they'd be fighting at each other's throats for four years. Uh, to try to jockey for position. So you can't do that. You can't wait till the end of a four-year mandate because they won't be able to get anything through Queen's Park at the end of their mandate. It has to be done now. The city council will never agree with it. It's like ripping off a Band-Aid. You just got to do it. And that's assuming that you like the idea. I do. Reducing the size of council is important. It will make it more functional. But it's not the only thing that should be done, and, and it may not be the first thing that needed to wow. be done. But there, you know, something has to be done because it doesn't work down there. We we have had all of the advisors now advise, and we leave it to the minister, the former <laughs> minister, to hear all that advice mm -hmm. and render her verdict. Well, I think I I, I can take from each side of the table. Um, yes, uh, he the premier had every right to do what he did. Uh, but um, I'll, I'll take it from a different pr practical perspective as someone like you, Karen, who have, have run for politics. It's a big decision to run. And you plan your life around it. You may quit your job. You, you get support. You, you start raising money. <clears throat> to be told in the middle of a campaign that y that seat doesn't exist anymore and you, if you want to run, you'll have to run over there, which you don't have a chance or you, you never planned for it, um, that's just completely unfair. Uh, the second thing, I would disagree with Mark. I think they could have done it after the, this election. Uh, and they wouldn't have had any uh, legal challenges, really. And they would have gotten it through and it would have been more democratic. And the notwithstanding clause was not meant to be a convenient thing for someone to push their agenda through. It was meant as uh, a clause that would be thought about, consulted on, and used very, very rarely. I, I don't think this... Uh, fits that criteria, and others more experienced than me in these affairs, like uh, those that wrote the Constitution and the, uh, the Charter, uh, would say the same thing. Well, the Andrew, only, let, sorry, go ahead, Mark. The only people this is unfair to right. are the politicians. Sessions. And absolutely zero Ontarians outside the political bubble give a damn about whether politicians are inconvenienced Actually, that, or it's that's, fair. Sorry, that's not true. It's unfair to voters as well. There are lots of voters who are now complaining to their councillors and to the city clerk's office that they don't know what ward they're going to be in and they don't know, you know, which candidates they should be paying attention 90 to. Ninety percent of voters don't know what ward they're in now and they never did. They show up at the polling station, they pick a name off a list. So why? They never think so how many the other lists in, there are. So what's the interest in alienating those who are paying attention and voting? I, I don't but, think the aim was yeah, to alienate. Yeah, so I, I'm actually campaigning for a couple candidates and going door to door. And the response is pretty much, well, you know, I think it should be a 25 council. Like, that is generally the response. 25 seats. 25 seats. It should be a 25 person council because council doesn't get much done and they don't really see the issue there. There is a legitimate concern about the notwithstanding clause, how it was used, and the statement of, I did it this time and I will do it again. So that's the concern is what, okay, whether I, th by and large, agree it's 25, whether you should have done it that way, I don't really know. But the fact that you'd use the notwithstanding clause now, on a, on a, I would call, relatively trivial provincial issue. But when does it become serious? Let me pick up on that with you, Deb Hutton, because it was, from what I have heard, it was one thing for the Premier to say, I will use the notwithstanding clause as I'm allowed to, to resolve this to my satisfaction. You know, I have heard it fed back to me that people have said, it's another thing to say, I'm going to use it willy-nilly whenever I want to get my way all the time. Do you see a distinction between the two? I, I do. Uh, to be fair uh, to the Premier, I, I do see a distinction between the two. That being said, they have been in power for three, four months, three months, I think, and look at how many lawsuits have already been launched. Now, those on the other side will say that's because the government is who they, is who they are. I would argue as a Conservative, this is what we were going to face because he is a Conservative and he, because he is going to make changes to the status quo. So what choice do you have when out of the gate all your opponents use the courts automatically to oppose what the legislature, I believe, has the right to do? Let me give a bit of a checklist to you, Brother Coyne, on who's standing with whom. We see on the one hand, former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, whose daughter happens to be the Attorney General of Ontario right now, saying, I never would have used the notwithstanding clause. I never imagined any circumstances where I could have used it. It was unthinkable for me to use. You have Bill Davis, who was one of the architects of the thing back in 1981, on the same side. 
Jean Chrétien, Roy Romano, Roy McMurtry, Peter McKay, they are all on the side of this ought not to be happening. There are others we've seen actually, I think last week, Christy Clark, the former BC Premier, Jean Charest, the former uh, Premier of Quebec, uh, one more, Brad Wall from Saskatchewan say, yep, it's okay, he can use it, it's well within his rights to do so. Do e any of those big players sway you one way or another? Well, it's not entirely surprising to hear that premiers would like to be able to be, to be ex exempted from the charter. Uh, that's what people in government like to do. They don't. They want life to be made easier for governments. They don't want to have the tiresome business of having to f defend their laws in well, courts. Bill except. Davis being a notable exception. That's right. But uh, what I would say is that for a lot of these people, it's a little late in the game to be suddenly saying, oh, we never intended the, the, the notwithstanding clause to be used this mm -hmm. way. Um, there's a lot of separate issues here, but they all kind of join. There's what we think about the notwithstanding clause in general, and I'm opposed to it in general for reasons we can get into. There's this particular use of it on this case, which a lot of people would say is ridiculous. It's, it, just because you didn't get your way in one court case when you could have just appealed the case uh, if you didn't like the ruling, which is what normal law-abiding governments do. And then there's this, this threat that he's going to use it again and again and again, and in fact that other premiers looking at this may follow his example. This will set precedents that will normalize the use of notwithstanding clause. If you put all those together, it is if you leave a loaded gun lying around, somebody's going to pick it up and shoot it. So when they put this clause in the Constitution, maybe in their own minds, it was only ever going to be used by high-minded Solons who were just going to use it for the most extreme examples in, in extraordinary circumstances. But real flesh and blood politicians in the real world are going to use it for different purposes. If you look at the way the notwithstanding clause has been used, the government of Alberta, for example, used it to exempt themselves from lawsuits from mentally handicapped people who'd been forcibly sterilized in the 40s. What a high and shining ideal was upheld there. Or they tried to use it to exempt themselves from the, from the uh, same-sex marriage when, until they were informed that's not actually provincial jurisdiction. So the real world of where it's actually used is not this, you know, it's only going to be used in extraordinary circumstances. And the people who put it in the Constitution in the first place should look at themselves in the mirror. Karen Stintz. But to your point, though, in the real world, it, it, it's not a, it has a time limit. It's a five-year clause. So it's not like it's in perpetuity. And it does reflect the will of the population. And that's why it was put in there with a five-year. So that if the public doesn't like what the government's doing and in invoking the notwithstanding clause, the public can vote the government out yeah. and a new government in. Right. So, so there's, so there's if you checks bring, and balances so, along the way. So if you bring in a law that beats up on an unpopular minority, for example, in Quebec, mm -hmm. then, yeah, you can go back to the majority and ask them again, hey, how did you feel about us beating up on that unpopular minority? Chances are they may be okay with it. It's not actually that much of a check and balance, it seems to me. It's something, I grant you, it's something. But the whole premise of the thing was that, that this was somehow necessary, that we couldn't just actually live up to the Charter of Rights that we just pa finished passing, because that would be inconvenient, I think is, is typically Canadian two-facedness, frankly. Uh, it's not the actual compromise that yeah, it's held it, to be. The compromise is Section 1. The compromise is the Reasonable Limits Clause. Mm -hmm. We don't need an Unreasonable Limits Clause on top of it. Go ahead, Marie. I would also question the motivation behind it. Is it really for efficiency? Or is this uh, a payback for how uh, the late Rob Ford exactly. was uh, beat exactly. so, you know what, It I'm, just seems mm -hmm. very petty, as speaking as a psychologist. I, I, I do think he, it's revenge. And it was not on the campaign uh, platform. If it was on the campaign platform, fair enough. And to say, oh, we, we were going to make government more, uh, 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 more e efficient, and, that, and therefore that translates into what we're doing now, that's so bogus. You didn't like so this and so I'm not a psychologist and I'm not a professor, but I don't think, and, and both Karen and Mark can speak to this better than me, but I don't think Toronto City Council has been functioning well. I think there is a lot of heavy lifting that needs to be done over the next four years that will involve the province. And quite frankly, I find it petty to say that this is somehow a vindictive act as opposed to smaller government for many of us works more effectively. Yeah, that is out there, though. You've got to acknowledge... Of course it's out there. No, there's but, but opponents to this but very but issue. But it's, it's out there, and Mark, I'll, I'll put this to you since you were there when Doug Ford was at City Hall. The suggestion is that Doug Ford's experience as a Toronto City Councillor on one term was so appallingly awful for him <laughs> that he couldn't wait to get his revenge, and now he's seeking it. Would you say there's absolutely nothing to that view? I think uh, any pleasure that he takes that is vengeful is a, is a, is a bonus. Uh, I think what Doug learned working on council is that council doesn't work. Right. And, and it doesn't. And it's not about the people on council. It's not. 
it's it's about the structure of council. It's about the fact that it's they're they're all equal. That in the midst of a debate on subways, someone can stand up and move a motion to ban plastic bags, and the whole council gets sidetracked down a rabbit hole. That shouldn't be possible. They have a committee structure that doesn't do anything, because you can vote one way at committee and then vote the opposite way at council. Everything is relitigated again at council. Why have a committee structure then? But how There's an executive committee that, that doesn't have any executive well, How does powers. that change if you just reduce the number of councillors? It, it, well, it, it doesn't. This no, is sorry, just there's no it doesn't. evidence It that needs to be more than, more than just that. But what reducing the number of councillors does is it reduces the amount of time it takes to do nothing. You can do nothing much more efficiently because at three minutes to ask questions per member and five minutes to speak per member, eight minutes times 47 minutes on every issue of about 40 that are debated during an average council session, there's over 100 usually, but a lot of them are adopted on consent. It makes for ridiculous meetings. No one even pays attention. Anything that happens after eight o'clock right. is, is, is absolute nuts. Ask so it, the, the, the structure needs to Patricia change. Patricia wanted to make a point. There's no evidence that smaller councils uh, work more effectively. You can't just measure it in terms of time. It's not like Toronto City Council is meeting every day, all How day, How much all research have you done on that? How many councils have you measured and what metrics did you use to okay. determine that? So the city of Brampton also has reversed its uh, transit decisions in the same chaotic way. They have 10 council members. The city of Sarnia has eight, and they still had a toxic mayor situation where So you've done no research. Council... Your anecdotes equal my well, this, anecdotes. This, this we'll is call data. It no, this, this is, is data. data. Empirically provable facts here. Okay. Yeah, it's we have... anecdotal. No, it's not. Well, it's a fact. Well, it's... it's a fact that the mayor wanted an LRT in Brampton to go a certain way, and the council voted yeah. against her. I mean, these are all. I mean, these facts. are the, these are the kinds of issues that have been raised as demonstrations of Toronto's ineffectiveness as a council. And I'm telling you that there are smaller councils in this province that have struggled and fallen apart, and the same divisiveness with eight and ten councillors. You can shrink it to twenty-five. Um, but, but there's no evidence that that's going to make it more effective or less dysfunctional. I would also dispute that it's dysfunctional in the first place. I mean, yes, there are political divisions on city council, but it doesn't prevent them from making decisions, and the decisions don't always go the same way. Let's go Karen and then Andrew. Well, I, I mean, I, I will agree with you that I don't think there's any evidence to suggest the council is dysfunctional. It operates the way it's intended to, as is a, a body with no parties. It's a con Every single vote is a consensus-based <laughs> vote. And arguably, at a time of real crisis in our city, when we didn't ha actually have a functioning mayor at the helm, council continued to govern, and the city continued to function. So I don't think there's any evidence that council is dysfunctional. What I, what I do think is that, to, Deb, to your point, that there is some heavy lifting that has to get done in the province. And using Toronto City Council as an example of fortitude in decision making will be useful down the road when there's other difficult decisions to be made, because no one is going to question the resolve of the premier to do what he said he's going to do, because all he has to say is, Look what I did in Toronto. Andrew. Uh, the budget of the provincial government is $150 billion. The bu budget of city council is $10 billion. The savings here are trivial. And they're achieved at the expense of representation. People talk about fewer politicians. What they're really saying is larger wards. It's a bit like saying, let's have larger class sizes because we'll have fewer teachers. It's that beyond a certain point, it's a false economy. It may be something to recommend it. We can argue back and forth about whether 25 or 47. I've seen no evidence whatsoever that this is such an emergency, such a crisis, that it has to be passed through right away by means of emergency legislation. All of the things that have been wrapped around this, that are basically amount to the Premier's not getting away and he's, he's his own way and he's not happy about it. I should follow up on this because you're, I think, the only one around this table who has sat on Toronto City Council. Yes. If you had, you had what, 50, 60,000 constituents? when yes. you were a city councillor? Yep. If you had that bumped up to, say, 120 or 130,000, as will be the case on a 25-member council, how would your life as a politician trying to serve constituents have been different? Well, it would shift my role significantly because you, you just can't deal with the constituency matters. So you can't deal with parking pads and street issues and potholes and fences and neighbour disputes and compost days and the things that councillors are typically known for in their communities because a smaller council is going to be dealing with more citywide issues. So when people call City Hall asking why my garbage didn't get picked up today, their chances of getting you... Are zero. 311. Call 311. Call 311. Yeah. Which is what is there for. Yeah. Like, and my, you can argue you know, that that's, that's what, that is a system that is intended to do just that. And if you find that you're irritated with the number of speed bumps in the city, well, then you'll probably be happy because there'll be less of them because no one will be there to administer that request anymore. I thought uh, Rob Ford's calling card was calling people back, customer service. Is the Premier now putting in place a new council which will make customer service harder? I don't know. Rob Ford managed to make 
phone calls back to people when he was covering the whole city uh, as a counselor from Ward 2, mm -hmm. and uh, was quite well known for that. Rob Ford opposed the idea of 311. He thought that it should be a counselor's job to return those calls, not a staff uh, servant's job, civil servant's job. Council overruled him. The very councillors now who are arguing that their job returning those phone calls is so indispensable. Um, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Is there too much hypocrisy going on I, here? Absolutely. I think all, and I don't, I'm not saying I'm right and you're wrong. And we, we don't know. We didn't have a chance to consult. We didn't have a chance to have any say in this. It was undemocratic the way it was done. The use of the clause was extreme. Uh, the, the, the architects of the charter and that clause have come out and said so. Uh, yes, there are people that have supported, of course. We didn't have time to, to consult. And mm -hmm. getting back to this only hurts the politicians, when you poison the well and you, and, and you affect the quality of politicians that bother to go into politics after these kinds of things are done, it does affect the people. It does affect the people. And we need good politicians. We all, we're always saying we need better politicians. This is not a step towards that. And again, I could be wrong. You could be right. Uh, but we, yeah. who knows? Well, we did not have that time to well, consult and, and study. And I think that's the thing. We just don't know. Yeah. We don't know what it's... Well, I mean, can let's I just say on the know. timing, sure. yeah, though, Steve? So, so once the Premier made this decision to move forward, for reasons I believe have to do, as I said, with how the next four years works in the province and the city, then I think he would have been extremely hard-pressed to back down from that when the court challenge was brought and he lost. Because I think that with this sitting there and, and for him to have said, okay, I'll, I'll do legislation that will be in effect in 2022, it would have been complete dysfunction over the next four years. As councillors were worried about that, we're fighting that, as opposed to what we really need them to get doing over the next four years. Do you worry, if I can use the analogy used earlier, do you, do you worry about that loaded gun sitting there on the counter and somebody finally picking it up and firing it? So as I said earlier, I'm not a fan of that particular piece of the tone and the, well, and the argument. That's kind of significant. But I, I don't disagree, and, and I didn't at the outset of your show. Mm -hmm. But I do believe in this situation, he chose a path, he's following the path. To Andrew's earlier point, he is appealing the decision, but for the, for the sake of timing and so that we can get on with the October 22nd election, he's also chosen this temporary but Section you, but, 33 use. But the government has other tools at its command as well. We're, they're going to be in court Tuesday right. uh, getting a stay or seeking a stay. So if the immediacy of the thing is an issue, that deals with that. You're not, you, know, you, can, you can set aside the ruling temporarily. The, the notion that you had to leap immediately to notwithstanding uh, as if this as I, as if this was some sort of crisis is just completely self-serving. But argument. I believe Saskatchewan, the first time it invoked Section 33, had 33 had a similar position, which was we're going to fight, and in the meantime, it was over a union issue, I believe. Mm -hmm. We're going to fight, and in the meantime, we're going to invoke Section 33. In the end, Section 33 wasn't necessary, but they headed down that path probably also for a timing well, issue, that, which is what I see this to That be. is a good point. If the court comes out for the provincial government tomorrow, then Section 33 disappears as the, and the gun sits there on the table still having not been used. Right. But always inviting its use. So that's always part of the problem yeah. with the but clause. That, that was the point that's of Section 33. No, but, right, that's, but, but Section 33, it's there to use. And the fact why, it hasn't been used That's why really it was problematic argument. to have put it in the first place. Yeah, but the, yes. There wouldn't be a charter, Andrew, well, but, if there, if there yeah, wasn't that section. That's that is true. That, that is true. Was the, people the say this all the time as if it clinches the argument. All that says is to get the people who happen to be around at the time to come to the table, maybe or maybe not, this was part of that, the necessary part of the deal. We can't run counterfactuals to, to argue one way or the other on that. But what it doesn't say is, therefore, you can't criticize it now. You can't object to its use now. You can't say that we shouldn't be doing this now. It, all it says was that that was the terms of that deal then. It doesn't, it's not wholly writ because of it. Patricia, I saw you trying to get in. No, I was just thinking that even before we get to Section 33 and questions of the timing, introducing this legislation at all um, is a bit of a crushing of deliberative democracy that I think we should be concerned with. City Council had the authority under the City of Toronto Act to do the consultation and to pass the, 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 the change from 44 to 47 wards. It was done through a, a very solid process that held up at court and the OMB. Um, and, and if we believe in deliberative democracy, we shouldn't be comfortable with another government just overturning that. That Especially is, without a cause. That is all true, but some will also argue that going from a 45-member 
council, which it is today, to a 47-member council, putting even more members on city council. Uh, you know, 48, what actually, including the mayor. 48, the, including the mayor. 48, yeah. including the mayor. You know, what politician in his or her right mind is going to vote to end his or her job, even if it means a smoother functioning council? But they didn't do it out of a partisan basis. I mean, they may have chosen that because, yes, they didn't want it, but 38 out of the 44 wards had their boundaries changed. So it's not like they were unaffected by this decision. Yeah. They might have voted for the status quo. That might have made sense. But this is also based on a very good study done by an independent third mm -hmm. party. That's okay. not true. Yes, it's no. very no, much it's true. Not well, true. You're There's dissing a, the Canadian Urban no, Institute no, no, no. now. That is it not may true. be true. No, there's, but a, it's absolutely there's another true. aspect of this just than the numbers, and that was trying to move towards greater equality between the different wards in yes. terms of the number of voters within them. The reform that she's talking about would move city council closer towards equality, whereas going back to the, going to the 25 federal and provincial writings, they're, they're notably less equal and are going to get less equal over time, which may explain what's going on here, because not coincidentally, what that will result in is a seat that is a council that is over-representing the suburbs and over-representing the types of voters that vote for, for Doug Ford. So it may be that that's really what's going on. Oh, Karen, you wanted to say that. Well, again, I mean, the, the conversation has shifted and turned, but, <laughs> but again, and what all the study may have been demonstrating that better effective representation is done by a lower ratio of representatives to politician. But I can tell you at the door, and I've been in Midtown and I've been in Scarborough knocking on doors for <coughs> candidates, the general consensus is 25 is, a, is an okay number. And people aren't that worried about the fact that it's going to be 80 or 100,000 people to a representative. They're, they're, but they, you know, as I say, they express worry about how it was done, why it was done, the mm. use of the notwithstanding clause, whether that was too much. Let me pick up on the how. Yeah. Is there anybody, Sheldon, yeah, wide shot, that's what I need right now. <laughs> Is there anybody at this table who thinks Doug Ford campaigned on this during the last no. provincial election no, campaign? No, 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 of course not. No. No. Of course but not. I, I, I wouldn't argue that it was unexpected in the oh, sense that he is on uh, a path for leaner, more efficient government. That's what that he campaigned on. very clear. On. Yes, he did campaign on leaner, more efficient government. Without right. ever specifying what he was going to cut. Also true. Yeah. Okay. So is that problematic for you? That, that well, he got elected to do that, and I would <laughs> is, consider is this a tool. the provincial government then? Well, if you recall, we have, the Conservative Party mm -hmm. in the past has shrunk the provincial government. He I don't know that that was, is his plan, he, but we he, have done that in the past. He specifically said he was not going to cut a single civil service job. Yes. Now, no, it depends no. whether you count city councillors, I suppose, as civil servants or not. Which uh, I don't. Which, I, I don't, don't think But they're public does. employees. Uh, so, you know, he, he sold a, a thing I mean, he was not going to cut any spending, but somehow there were going to be magically efficiencies were going to appear. That's a long way from, oh, by the way, I'm going to cut council in half. If so you, you disagree with the actual policy, Andrew, like you think, forget timing, forget all of the mechanisms, you disagree with I'm the notion that we should go to 25? I'm certainly skeptical of it, and the, and the arguments that I see made for it are so baseless that it causes me to have a lot of doubt about the argument. I, yes. I just, you know, I, I find when people push back on this being anti-democratic, at its core, I will have a vote as a Toronto resident on October the 22nd, and following that vote, I will be represented at City Hall. That, to me, is pretty much democracy. Actually, at this and point, we I, don't and even if know I if the election is going to take place. Let me finish. Yeah. If I feel that I am underrepresented because we're at 25 in the city as opposed to 47 or 48, then I have an opportunity to vote against Doug but Ford in ask, four years. How well are you represented if that city councillor you elect, who then participates in a larger body with other city councillors and makes a decision they have the authority to make and they do in, in a thorough and proper way, then that decision is overturned. You're not represented at all. If the province can reverse the decision of city council, it doesn't matter that you can vote for city councillor. But I, I still maintain the notion that the size of the municipality is fully within the jurisdiction of the province. That's different than what you're saying, which is any time Toronto does something, the, the, city, the province is going to overrule it. No, no I'm just evidence. saying that they've done that. That's exactly what they're doing right now. But City on, Council made a decision the and they have the authority makeup, to do so. I don't but mean by I, constitution, I think a, but on the, yeah. the, the inherent makeup of the city. That is the purview of the province because municipalities are creatures of the province. I wonder how far that purview goes, and I want to go to Mark on this one. If, if in fact, as he did, Doug Ford campaigned on smaller, more efficient government in the province of Ontario, why is he only taking on Toronto? What about all the other city councils out there? Well, you do one at a time, and one is the... And frankly, Toronto has a different problem, perhaps, than the other cities. Mm -hmm. The problem with Toronto isn't the proportionality of representation. 
of number of voters per per councillor. It's the it's the it's the structure of council and the size of it. They cannot have a meeting and discuss things in, in a in a productive way. It's not physically possible. Now, this is a very blunt instrument to try to, in one change, address that. And it's probably not the one that I would have picked to do first, but it is one of a number of them. And it's the one that the people want. I mean, what people How who do are- How you know? Because we did a study through the Canadian Urban Institute that said that. And the reason why I think that study was bogus is because of the political involvement in that study. That study, the very first conclusion in its very first report, said that the vast majority of Torontonians wanted, 20, wanted an equal number of wards as they wanted ridings. That was the overwhelming majority. It wasn't overwhelming, but yes, it was a majority. It opinion. was overwhelming, and, and that's exactly the word that was used by. The let me finish. The more and then people you can... talk, their, their opinion changed. The more information and discussion had, no, they had, that's not true. Their opinion changed. That, yes, it that is. That option was that's taken exactly off the, the table says. after the first iteration of that study because wiser minds decided that that wouldn't work. And wiser minds decided. It wasn't removed from the table permanently. City Council sent them back to look at it again, and they did, and they came back with 47. Karen Stintz. Karen Stintz. Well, and I, I think that there's another theme as well that, that uh, the Premier is tapping into, which is that governments can't get things done anymore. Whether it's the city or the province, like transit can't get built, things don't get done, appeals are always... So I think what the Premier is tapping into now is that I'm going to do this to show people that I can get it done and I'm gonna get transit done, and I'm gonna get city council reformed, and I'm gonna get, I don't even know what his next thing is gonna be. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's, that's what we voted for. We voted for a government without a platform. Well, let's right? hear a little bit more from him, shall so, we? Yeah. Control room, Doug Ford at his press conference unveiling all of this, not that long ago. Go. The courts use every tool in their toolbox to make this happen. Well, guess what? I'm gonna use every tool at our disposal to make sure we hold up the Constitution and the democratic right of the people of Ontario. And I will not waver from representing the people. We ran our whole campaign on For the People, and the people elected a government, and that government is going to serve the people. We do hear the Premier use this expression, For the People, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I want to get into some discussion here tonight, if I can, now, on who the people are that this Premier is working on behalf of. Go ahead, Deb, weigh in. Short answer, taxpayers, all of us. 13 and a half million Ontarians. Absolutely, that's what happens when you become the Premier. Do you believe he's representing all 13 and a half million Ontarians? The number he used was 2.3 million, the, the ones who voted for him, many of whom are outside of the city of Toronto. I mean, it's absolutely true that, that cities are creatures of the provinces. It's another question whether they should be and whether they should be treated quite so cavalierly uh, by another level of government. If, you know, if, if usually when councils or, or election assemblies aren't working very well, the remedy is the voters change the participants. Mm -hmm. If it's a structural thing, maybe the voters of the City of Toronto should be consulted on what structural changes they would like to see made the City Council, rather than it being imposed from on high from another level of government. Um, he certainly made a point in that press conference of, of counterposing the rule of, of the courts, or the rule of law versus democratic as, uh, assemblies. But it was a democratic assembly. It was the Parliament of Canada and the nine, nine of the ten governments who passed the Charter of Rights in the first place. So the notion that this is pitting courts versus legislatures is untrue. It's pitting one law passed by one legislature versus another and higher law that is the Constitution of Canada. And if he, again, if he didn't like the ruling he got from the judge, and a lot of people questioned the reasoning in that ruling, that's when you appeal. Which but he section is. Section 33 of section 33 of what, Andrew? It is part of the Constitution. Yeah, You're right. So is the Queen. So if the Queen started willy-nilly uh, <laughs> denying uh, royal assent to legislation, I think some of us would have a problem, even though each individual instance of it would be technically legal under the Constitution. So what matters is not just the letter of the law, but the norms surrounding it. The norms surrounding the, the notwithstanding clause were supposedly going to be that it was going to be used rarely. I think they were naive in assuming that, and assuming that you wouldn't get a premier coming along who would use it in ways that perhaps the framers didn't intend. That's well, the way the, that the nine people who put it in there intended it. I don't think, ten I think, people, I think ten we've heard from some of them that they did not intend it should be used to, to you know, fix fights between city council, city councillors. Let, let me get back to Marie on this. For the people, who are the people you think this premier represents? 
Well, I agree with Deb. He should be representing all of us. You think he is? But uh, he himself has said, to Andrew's point, for the 2.8 million people that voted for... 2.3, sorry. Mm -hmm. People that voted for uh, my party, this is what I'm doing. So uh, I, I, it's a question mark. And I think time will tell. Now, politically, doing it right now was kind of smart. Mm -hmm. Because in four years, okay. you know, people have forgotten. If he had done it closer to four years, it would have been more chaotic. Uh, it reminds me when uh, the uh, Ernie Eves government um, just had the budget speech done in a hotel as opposed to... It was in the Magna plant. In the Magna plant, thank yeah. you, as opposed to the legislature, which who would have thought that would have been such a big deal? But it was to the people of Ontario. It was, it was quite interesting. So I think if he had done this uh, later, on that point, I'll agree with Deb, for different reasons, it would have been more chaotic. Mark, do you, I mean, that, that magna example of introducing the budget, which I think all the people around the Premier thought was a pretty clever idea mm -hmm. at the time, mm -hmm. turned out it was not. People actually expected their government to behave in a way that was consistent with, you know, do new things, but in a way that was consistent with legislative practice. Do you think any of the people around this Premier are worried that that precedent come, could come back to bite them in the butt on this case? I, I suspect the people closest to him are, but I think that the people writ large don't care. Uh, one wit. I mean, speaking as a radio host, uh, you know, the people that I talked to yesterday don't, not, not one of them give a damn about the not Where do they call clause. in from? They call in from all over southern Ontario, right? And a few from further afield. I would agree but, with that. Uh, actually. Yeah, they just, they don't care, I don't right? Think it's anyone not... in Hamilton really cares, except yeah. maybe uh, some people that really watch these yeah. things closely. Yeah, well, political people and that. sort of legal people are all yeah. wrapped up I, in the But I don't think that precedent. was the point. I think it was the way it was done. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think that, that that's. I should ask Patricia this, though. I mean, the, the, the 416 has its, and, and even beyond the 416, the old city of Toronto mm -hmm. has a particular way of looking at the world. Do you think once you get outside the 416, this is a big yawn for people? Uh, in some instances, yes, although in the last couple of days there have been indications that it's not only going to be Toronto, so I think others are paying attention. Um, I think it's also worth noting that mayors of other Ontario cities and cities across the country are speaking out about this. So it, it is beyond the 416, for sure. Um, it may be not southern Ontario, but definitely across the country. Mark, in just one point, not just outside the 416, and not, but also within the, the 416, 416, I will say that there are... Uh, some people who I've spoken with who are Ford supporters who voted for him uh, who are a little miffed because they, they're concerned that this is getting in the way of the stuff that they want to see. Too now, much uh, Toronto time for the Premier, right? Eh? Well, too much not getting rid of carbon tax, not, getting, not all the other stuff, reducing taxes, that kind of stuff. I, I don't think that's a substantive reality because those things are going to take time and this really hasn't taken that much time. It's taken a lot of our attention. But the reality is the perception of it and the media bandwidth has been consumed by this. So yeah. your, your only input is this is all the government cares about. I, I want to, if I can, uh, a bit of an audible here, Sheldon, but if you could bring the clip of the Premier back up and play it with no sound on it, though. I have a question for everybody around this table here. Some things in politics deal with reality. Some things deal with optics. I want to know what the optics are of the Premier deciding to use Section 33, the notwithstanding clause of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms of the Constitution, and his attorney general is nowhere in sight. The attorney general has had very little to say about the first time a legal matter has ever happened in the 37-year history of this province since the constitutional agreement was come to. Uh, I've noticed this. I don't know if this is a big deal, so I'm going to ask all of you for your advice. Andrew, what do you think? I'm not sure I would put particular focus on Caroline Mulroney uh, as I would on the cabinet in general. Uh, and I think one of the things we're seeing, I mean, this is the intersection of a lot of things that are wrong with the structure of Canadian politics, one of which is the total leader domination. So the people in that cabinet know if they ever want to serve in cabinet and ever want to be around the table, they better line up behind the premier and his coterie of advisors who came up with this. Isn't that the same for every government? Uh, it's, absolutely. But it's, it's, we're seeing an egregious uh, example of where this can lead. Uh, one would hope that people would stand up to this kind of arbitrary government. One would hope pe people in the caucus and the people in the cabinet would. It's unfortunate that they're not. Would you, as a former cabinet minister, if the government of your day were going to make a significant announcement having to do with the Constitution, would you have expected the Attorney General to be at the press conference, to say something at some point about any of this? I would have ex expected a lot more. I would have expected consultation with caucus. I would have expected consultation with cabinet, with the civil service. 
again, I go back to my original uh, words that it's maybe the result is not negative, but certainly the process to get to the result was wrong and dangerous and precedent setting. Uh, def definitely there should have been much more consultation. And I know for a fact that there wasn't with caucus and with uh, and with uh, cabinet. I, I appreciate it was a that, Doug Ford decision. Yeah, right. I mean, I mean, everybody's acknowledged that. The, the, I'll acknowledge that, what's the word I'm looking for? Consistency being the hobgoblin of a small mind, and <laughs> plea, I plead guilty. But I do remember when Mike Harris was premier, if there was a significant legal announcement to be made, his attorney general was standing beside him. Why isn't that happening mm, today? Not always. It depended on the venue. What I will say is in preparation for this evening, I read an incredibly eloquent and strong speech by Attorney General Caroline Mulroney on second reading of this bill. So I, I push back on the notion that she's not been around. because No, I, she certainly spoke I, to it in the House, she, for sure. Absolutely, and she has done newsers on at press conferences mm -hmm. uh, since this all broke. So I, I, I do push back let's, on that. Let's, let's be clear, though. She was a new minister. To go against mm -hmm. this would mean she would not be a minister the next day. Yeah. I mean, to, to be just sworn in and to be put in this position, she was put in an impossible position, as was uh, Christine Elliott. The other day when she got up to answer a question and Doug Ford kind of got up to answer for her, I mean, I think that now says that's a lot Now, that's different. We have to say, I just have yeah. to explain what you're talking about yeah. there, because... Because Christine Elliott, the deputy premier, was asked a question in the legislature by the opposition. Mm -hmm. And as she got up to answer it, she punted it to the premier. Now, usually the way these things work, the premier punts it to a minister. I've never seen a question <laughs> being punted up before. That's not that true. That was odd, eh? That's not true. Well, I no. haven't seen it. I'm I sure it's happened. I sat there for 10 years, as you know, in, okay. the, in the little backdrop at Queen's Park. And you make a decision as a caucus in a cabinet on who's going to carry the ball on something. You think it's problematic and that Christian Elliott's being muzzled on this? I do not agree with your premise, Steve, so no. That's it's pretty, not problematic. She's not being muzzled. And, and Caroline has responded to a number of these things. And, and I, you know, I disagree with the notion that she disagrees with the premier. This well, yeah, no is... no one's saying she is. Well, no, uh, Marie is, actually. She said she no, would be in, she she was in a, an she... impossible position. How is she in an impossible well, position? This is her a legal... Her own father, the former prime minister of the country. That's awkward. Uh, yeah, that's awkward. Yeah. And, and, and she's probably talked herself into saying this is the right thing, but... Uh, I'm pretty sure a, very a female attorney general is yeah. allowed to have her own yeah, opinions. Yeah, I, I, I well, think she's... Also, uh, having worked well, for the Ford administration, Mark and I, we both worked for the Ford administration, albeit at city council, there is no question. You're either on the team or you're not on the team. That's right. And at the point when I went off the team, uh, you know what? It was, a, it was I certainly understood what it meant to be off the team in a very material mm -hmm. way. And so I wouldn't expect any member of his cabinet or caucus to come out and say anything other than publicly support the premier and if the premier's position was if you can't support me then don't show up and they just mm. maybe made a choice not to show up but they're certainly not going to say anything in opposition to this. With just a few minutes to go here I do want to Patricia let me get you to start off on this. We are so polarized in our politics in this province now in this world now. Can you see on the other side of the table that they may have they may be a little bit right in some of what they're saying. Can you give them something? On, on this question? Yeah. No. Can't give them anything, right? <laughs> well, you've got a, a study and a report and a deliberative democracy process that's all being crushed. I can't get on the side of, of any of that. Not on the side of it, but can you, can you see in any of their arguments something where, the yeah, only, you know... The only little bit of sincerity I will give you is I do believe... Oh, sorry, sincerity is what I would give you. I do believe that they believe in smaller government. Right. So I, I, I think that they are sincere in believing that this is going to make a difference. I think it's a very weak understanding of how city council works and what actually would make it more effective or more efficient. You know, questions of, you know, speaker's time and the committee structure. I think there I mean, I think there are lots of things you can do to make city council better. Uh, I think they genuinely believe smaller government, you know, can make a difference. There just isn't any evidence to, to back that up. And along the way, you're stepping on so many important uh, democratic um, conventions, you know, things that actually sustain democracy, that it isn't worth okay, it. Okay, let me try the other side. Mark, can you see in the arguments of the other side that, okay, I can understand why they think the norms of politics are being run roughshod on. I do see that. Uh, absolutely. Uh, th however, I would say that the average person wants them to, they don't like the norms of politics. They like some of the trappings and the history and the, you know, the, the tricorn hats and the provinces that still have them <laughs> for the lieutenant governors. But they don't like politics as usual. And so the idea that something's unfair to politicians, no one gives a damn. 
believe me. Uh, the idea that, you know, city councillors are going to lose their jobs, no one cares. What they want from their government at the city level is the garbage picked up on time, the water to be safe, the sewers to work, the basements not to flood. And calls return those kind of and things. representation. Yeah, but they're getting that from 311, which the council set up because the council 10 years ago said, we can't do this anymore. Well, well, you don't need to do it anymore. Uh, Andrew. Uh, those people are going to be cruelly and deeply disappointed if they think just by moving from 47 to 25, suddenly all of Toronto's problems are going to disappear <laughs> and they're going to get wonderfully effective wow. representation. I predict to you now the problems will still be with us. The no I do dispute the notion that Doug Ford has any sincere belief in smaller government. I don't see any <laughs> evidence from that, from anything he's campaigned on. He, 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 he will mouth those words when it suits him and then he'll promise people a chicken in every pot in the next breath. Um, I do think it's, there's a tenable argument to be made, notwithstanding my dis doubts about it, but there's a tenable argument to be made for the principle of reducing the size of the council. People can argue that one back and forth. I don't think there's any tenable argument to be made that it has to be done exactly now or that it requires emergency uh, legislation to countermand the Constitution. I don't think there's any basis for that whatsoever. I'm down to 30 seconds. Karen, you want it? Yeah, I think so because, yes, I do want it. The, uh, <laughs> the decision to reduce council, the way he did it, how he did it, the tools he said, this tool is here for me to use, I'm going to use it. It's setting the stage for the next four years. And if he's going to pick a fight, this was a pretty good one to pick because it's immediate, he's demonstrating his strength, and I think there's more to come. Normally, when uh, our discussions end, I thank each of you individually, but we have the cast of Ben-Hur here tonight. So <laughs> I'm not sure we have time for that, so I'll simply say, as a group, thank you. Good of all of you to make time in your schedules for us on TVO tonight. Thanks so thank much. You, thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.